name is Phil Weiser. It is such a pleasure to be serving as Colorado's Attorney General and to have a national leader in Seth Frotman with us today to talk about student debt and the challenges that so many borrowers are facing here in Colorado. Uh, this issue is personal to me. As the Dean of the University of Colorado Law School, I saw student debt rising and I saw the consequences and I made it one of my central goals to lower student debt. We did that. When I took over, average indebtedness for our graduates was $116,000 a year, thanks to holding tuition during my five years as dean and increasing scholarships. We got that down, that number, to $100,000 in debt, which is still a lot of money. And it is a scary topic for so many. Just to put this in context, in Colorado, we have almost 750,000 borrowers for student loans. Around 100,000 of those borrowers are living in rural Colorado. The total indebtedness of student loans alone in Colorado is approaching 30 billion. And the average debt that students have is almost $40,000. Now, law school, of course, is another matter. What we have to be really afraid of is what happens to people who are bearing that debt. And there are, I think it's fair to say, fiscal consequences and their psychic consequences too. 13% of the Colorado borrowers end up for one reason or another delinquent on their student loans. Around 100,000 of Colorado borrowers end up in delinquency or default. We've seen over the last decade, 107% increase in student loan balances. And what is painful is there are 56,000 people over 60 years of old still have student debt. And of course, of that group, we're seeing over 10% of them in delinquency. Now, what I think is important to know is there are remedies that are supposed to be there, but are being abused. Um, people have read and heard about some of the servicers not doing what they're supposed to do. One issue that's also personal to me and super painful is the public service loan forgiveness program, which right now in Colorado has a denial rate over 90%. And this, uh, even for temporary expanded public service loan re repayment programs, we almost have a 70% denial rate. Uh, this points to what really is a crisis right now. And one thing I just want to underscore because we could have a crisis on top of the crisis. There's a good New York Times Magazine story about lessons from 2009, 2010. And it talked about that we didn't have enough, let's call it reliable training available, community colleges, for example, and that for-profit colleges were quick to prey on people, marketing skills that they weren't delivering, loading people up with student debt. And so we have to be approaching this on all sides with grace and protection for student borrowers, as well as with vigilance about what programs are out there and are they operating in good faith or are they taking advantage of people and potentially racking up debt for which they're not gonna actually be able to repay it. And we've taken action here in Colorado. A number of people from our office have been real leaders, including uh, Libby Webster, um, who is with us today. Uh, finally, I just want to know, we also have a level of new oversight in our office. Uh, Martha Fulford is our uniform uh, credit uh, leader. She is really a rock star. Uh, she's also working with student loan ombuds persons to make sure that we're supporting everyone out there. So I'm, I'm very much committed to this. Like I said, it's personal to me on many levels, and I'm thrilled to have a little bit of a chance to visit with a national expert. So Seth, let's start high, high level here. I've talked about this as a student debt crisis. Is that a fair description? Uh, what's the level of debt and, and who's hurting during this difficult situation? Well, first I just wanted to say thank you so much for, uh, for joining us here today and uh, for this discussion. Uh, I've been traveling uh, many years of my life talking about student loans and I often uh, get asked, you know, it's very, very dark days. Um, you know, what can we point to in terms of optimism and hope? Who's out there standing up for student loan borrowers? 
uh, and I can say, uh, and I'm not just, you know, uh, trying to get brownie points, we always po point to the state of Colorado and your office and your efforts out there talking about someone um, every day who's waking up and trying to do the right thing on behalf of uh, the hundreds of thousands of people with student loan debt. So thank you first and foremost uh, for all of your efforts for making this a priority and for your amazing team and, and their work. Um, so it is absolutely a student debt crisis. I often say um, people actually don't understand how bad it is out there. You raise the really concerning and troubling numbers um, when it comes to Colorado um, and that is happening coast to coast. There is now $1.7 trillion of student loan debt. That means there's more student loans than there are all car loans. There's more student loan debt than there's all credit card debt. Um, and nearly 45 million Americans get a student loan bill each month. You know, and sometimes uh, you hear about this as just a bunch of millennials eating too much avocado toast or, you know, whatever meme is out there to try to argue that this is, you know, some individual group's personal responsibility or lack thereof. But, you know, you said it better than I could. This is an issue that impacts older Americans. This is an issue that impacts um, rural Americans. And I think you see that in Colorado. So, uh, absolutely, I think that this is a crisis. And unfortunately, what we've seen is um, Washington has only made it worse. And I know we're going to talk about that a little more today. Well, Seth, so one point to just level set is there might be people out there who don't have student debt. Why should they care about this issue? And how is this a broader economic issue for all of us? Sure, it's, it's a great question because what we see now as more and more data comes out, um, as more and more people have debt, is the student debt crisis is just is much more than just the individual balances on borrowers accounts or just more than even the 9 million borrowers who are currently in default on their loans. We see how student loan debt has this enormous domino impact both on individuals lives and their larger communities. So we're starting to see data that shows how student loan borrowers uh, are worse off financially across their lives. So they have less in retirement savings. Um, they have less in wage accumulation. They have uh, lower credit profiles. And all of this bounds together to hamstring individual communities as more and more people take on debt they're less likely to buy homes, to start small businesses, um, to uh, have a strong economic and financial footing. And too often when they trip and when they stumble and life happens, um, we see how that impacts maybe their ability to get a job or uh, other financial uh, aspects of their lives. But I think where this gets really scary and why this impacts all of us is that student debt um, is having very large societal impact. Um, we see how student debt is driving income inequality, driving racial inequality. And I think how I've said it is student debt is really like kerosene on the fire of all of these different cross currents that are really, you know, tearing apart our communities. And even if you don't get a student loan bill, absolutely student debt is impacting your community, your state and our country. One of the issues I mentioned earlier in my remarks, I'd love to get your thoughts on it, is the, let's call it consumer protection challenges around student debt and the situations consumers find themselves. I specifically mentioned for-profit colleges. One of the concerns I have here is the level of cynicism and distrust that is being driven by this is to me a profound concern. What are your thoughts on the consumer protection front and how can we do better? Absolutely, and it's, it is a great question. I think why it's so vital um, that leaders like you and your office has really made this a priority because on one hand, the student debt crisis is driven by these historic balances like you mentioned, just the sheer weight of student debt. But the less appreciated, less covered side is the consumer protection crisis. You know, with the $1.7 trillion, there's now in entire industries who have been propped up trying to get rich off the backs of struggling borrowers. So, you know, you raise for-profit schools, which are 
top of the list. There's private student lenders, there's student loan servicers, there's debt collectors, social media companies, private equity firms. Um, and I think what we've seen in all of these instances, how these companies team up together to add billions of dollars in needless debt on top of borrowers who are already struggling. But then as we know, across all markets, you know, you deal with this in mortgage and payday and consumer lending and car loans, is that these predatory actors also target the most vulnerable borrowers in your state and throughout the country. Um, and what we always hear in my trips to Colorado and otherwise is, you know, uh, I just took on this debt to get a better life for myself and my family. Um, and how was I ripped off in the process? And we need to spend a lot more time and energy. Um, and I know your office has been a leader on this, on cracking down on these just really horrific actors that target families who really done nothing wrong, but just take on debt to try to get a better life for themselves and their, their family. You already mentioned um, a lot of the consumer protection issues, but let me just add one, which is there are also now scammers out there who know about how prevalent student debt is, will call you and say, let us help you with your student debt. And all they're trying to do is get your banking information or credit card information or social security numbers to further put you in a world of hurt, maybe steal your identity. So that's call it a second order consumer protection problem, but also one I add to the list. Um, Seth, you also talked about Washington here. Obviously, this is personal and painful for you. Those who are not familiar with your background may not realize that you saw the agency you were at effectively walking away from its responsibilities in this area. What's the current state of protecting student borrowers in Washington, and how can we look forward to uh, improvement on that front? Sure, it's a great question, and I think, unfortunately, um, it's quite a disappointing answer, is that as the student debt crisis has gotten worse, um, uh, the, the current administration, um, Washington, um, has really just walked away from this fight to try to protect borrowers. So we've seen hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of new borrowers over the last four years now. Um, but we haven't seen any effort to actually um, stop the bleeding, or more importantly, on the consumer protection mission, is actually help stand up for them. So we've seen how this industry, Betsy DeVos, uh, and the, really the full range of the Trump administration, um, has sided with industry at each and every turn, rather than stand up to protect borrowers. So um, you raised a couple issues. Um, you know, when it comes to for-profit schools, we've seen how uh, this administration has sided with the schools who ripped off borrowers over the objections of even the veterans groups. We've seen, you've raised the issues around public service loan forgiveness. We've seen how um, illegal servicing practice, practices have hurt teachers and nurses and social workers, you know, throughout the state of Colorado, um, blocking them from getting access to public service loan forgiveness. Um, but instead of standing up for those borrowers, and I know that you even had to try to weigh in on court on these issues, um, they have sided with the very companies who's ripped those borrowers off. So I could go on and on and on, but I think it boils down to um, even in the absence of Washington do anything, they have actually tried to stop folks like Attorney General Weiser and your colleagues from doing the right thing. And I just think that that is outlandish, which is, you know, if you're not going to be part of the solution, at least get out of the way. But what we've seen is this administration has actually made, you know, your work um, even harder. And I know a lot of times that you have prevailed um, through expert lawyering and sheer perseverance, but um, borrowers should know that um, the administration time and time again has chosen um, really corrupt and predatory industry practices over their best interest. Seth, as you know, we've, we've had to sue the Department of Education several times and we have a very uh, good track record in court, but I would much rather be collaborating to solve these issues than having to uh, bring lawsuits. I, I wanna situate it now during the time of COVID and in the CARES Act, there were some protections and with leadership from uh, Martha Fulford and others, we were able to get some additional protections 
the way I talk about it is during this time and an associated economic fallout, we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. Some people are in yachts, others are in lifeboats, barely staying afloat. Talk about the importance of grace and uh, other forms of forbearance during this time so that people aren't forced into terrible decisions, whether it's paying their rent or mortgage or student loans or food. How, how should we uh, think about the challenges during the time of COVID? Sure, and it's, it's, it's such a good question. Um, so, you know, um, we often hear about the economic fallout of the pandemic in terms of um, risk of evictions or foreclosures or not being able to pay a car bill. Um, and those are obviously critically important. Um, but I'm worried that we haven't really fully understood or grasped the extent to which there's going to be a fallout in the student loan market. So I mentioned this before, but there are 9 million student loan borrowers who are in default um, before the pandemic ever hit. Uh, in 2019, uh, over a million student loan borrowers defaulted on their loans, or one every 26 seconds of every single day. Um, and I think in good news, there has been some help for student loan borrowers. So if, you, uh, if your loan is actually held by the federal government, um, so the overwhelming majority of loans, um, there is currently a payment pause. You don't have to make a payment. Um, there is no interest, and that runs until the end of the year. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is a positive step for millions of people. But I think it's also important to know that it has serious flaws in terms of long-term success and health. So I think two, two concerns here is, one, um, I think it merely kicks the can down the road. Um, and uh, borrowers were hurting before um, the crisis. And as you raise it, those not in yachts are gonna be hurting after the crisis and December 31st is a short time away um, and I'm worried we haven't put in place long-term success. But the second piece of this, um, again, where your office has shown tremendous leadership is there are millions and millions of borrowers that Washington has done nothing for. Um, and states were very effective at trying to get relief for those borrowers. Um, but again, I think it is short term, it doesn't impact everyone. Um, and, you know, the Herculean efforts by state law enforcement officials, I think, will only be able to go so far. Um, so I think, um, you know, we, we, I hope to talk more about what individual borrowers should know, but um, you're absolutely right, which is we are at a real inflection point. And when we think about long-term recovery, we absolutely need to be thinking about renters and home buyers and people with cars um, and people struggling with um, short-term loans. But we also need to be worried about student loan borrowers because again, uh, we were in a crisis before pa the pandemic ever hit and a lot of these borrowers never dug out and, we're, and you know, they're ex experiencing tremendous pain now um, and they're going to be for the foreseeable future. We, we have one other question from Tyler that I'd like to ask before handing it off to our great um, student loan uh, ombudsperson, which is, during the Obama administration, we saw some progress here, but there's still room for improvement in the broader area of, call it financial empowerment navigation. And if you listen to Michael Lewis's podcast, season two of Against the Rules, he talks about how powerful it is to have people who are coaching on financial literacy and financial empowerment, that people find themselves deep in a cycle of debt. And it's often a vicious cycle for people because they get further and further buried uh, in the case of this season, uh, they talked about someone grading her teeth regularly, uh, second order effects of being in debt. Um, what are some movements you've seen in financial empowerment, whether it's state, local level, or even ideas for the national level? Sure. So it's a great question. And um, unfortunately, it has come to this, right? You mentioned the problem with servicers, right? These student loan companies get hundreds of millions of dollars to try to do the right thing to help borrowers. Um, but unfortunately, time and time again, we see how borrowers get bad information, conflicting information or no information at all. And unfortunately, um, you know, your office has been one of the leads on investigating their practices and trying to hold them accountable. Um, uh, but there are borrowers out there who are hurting. And we've started to see some really innovative ideas 
um, to try to help borrowers, um, hopefully while Washington fixes this mess. So, you know, we've seen really creative and innovative ideas around coaching at the city level um, in terms of uh, financial empowerment offices through um, big cities, mid and mid middle, uh, middle sized cities, and even small cities um, trying to get in front of borrowers. Um, but my one piece of advice that I always kind of give here is that a lot of times people don't raise their hand with a student loan and ask for help. Um, and if you are thinking about the impact of coaching or the impact of counselors or providing um, like free financial advice is what we always encourage people to do is um, don't expect people to raise their hand and say they need help with their student loans. There is now a bunch of research coming out that shows how people don't think about it as a legal issue or think about this as uh, uh, something they want to talk about. So think about in your waterfall or scripts where you actually ask people if they have a student loan, because there are things that people could do to help, and especially in the state of Colorado with um, a lot of the Attorney General's work um, and the governor and the, uh, and the legislature, there are places to go if people feel like they've been ripped off. This is a good transition point for me to now officially introduce Libby Webster, a senior assistant attorney general here. She's in our consumer protection section and her work really over the last decade has been on the frontier I've already mentioned, which is actions by predatory for-profit colleges who are seeking to get students in debt but not get skills and thereby be in a hole. She has been able to obtain adjunctive relief, restitution, civil penalties, all to help support consumers and hold irresponsible and bad actors accountable. She's also engaged in higher ed policy issues, um, having worked with uh, negotiated rulemaking at the Department of Education on the gainful employment rule that is a protective measure against what she's been addressing on the back end. I've talked about Martha Fulford. She's a first assistant attorney general here and she also is the administrator of our uh, consumer credit unit. She oversees the student loan servicing effort that we lead. She also oversees consumer lenders, debt collectors and other debt management providers. She had formerly served with Seth at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau working on student loan issues. So this is uh, personal to her work um, we're thrilled to have both Libby and Martha on our team. Um, let me uh, turn it over. Great. Thank you so much, A.G. Weiser, and um, thank you, Seth. Um, thank you both for doing this today. Um, so I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity just to talk a little bit about the student loan ombudsperson role that we have here in our office. Um, and really what an exciting role it is. Um, in fact, it's modeled on Seth's old job <laughs> um, at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And um, certainly we thought um, and we believe it's really important to have this role at the state level um, doing this work um, at a time when, when borrowers really do need help. Um, so the student role, ombuds role means that we are taking a look at individual complaints and helping those individual borrowers navigate the repayment process, whether it's helping them um, reach out to their servicer to, to really get come to ground on what their issue is, um, or helping them to explain, you know, what what options they might have in terms of income driven repayment programs or um, uh, public service loan forgiveness. But there's a second layer on top of the, the work that we do with individual borrowers, which is that um, as Seth knows so well, student loan complaints are often the canary in the coal mine. And so it's, it's one borrower who says, this is a problem, I'm experiencing a problem, and I'm gonna go tell someone about it. And there's, there may be many other borrowers who, as Seth was saying, are experiencing that problem, but don't know to reach out um, and, and look for it. So complaints allow us to identify trends. And we have a whole team who are looking at the complaints that we receive to try to find those trends and figure out what to do about them. So our ombuds role um, has a policy component to it where we can advise policymakers about the trends that we're seeing um, and what um, appropriate action might look like. Um, and then we also, you know, <laughs> we work in the attorney general's office, so we can certainly consider legal action um, when that is appropriate based on what we're seeing in complaints. So. Um, we also have um, an education and outreach uh, component to the role. Um, and I think, you know, the idea of 
of empowering borrowers to help themselves so maybe they never need to come to our office is a really important part of it as well. So it's, it's a really exciting uh, role and we're, we're thrilled to have it here in the office. Um, and I'll turn it over to Libby to talk about uh, a little bit more about how, why complaints are so important. Thank you, Martha. Um, absolutely, and as Martha was saying, um, the complaints are really key for us um, in developing our program. Um, you know, if we, the, the complaints really give us kind of like the ground level as to what folks are experiencing. Um, and, and as Martha mentioned as well, I mean, we are in a position where we can um, communicate effectively with the servicer. We can review the loan history of the student borrower. And then we can effectively um, help that consumer um, get the, the help that, that they need. I mean, cons find it, uh, student loan, um, the student loans are, are quite complicated. I mean, I, I, I can speak from experience. It's, it's complicated to understand where you stand with your servicer and with, with your lender. And I, um, it, it's incredibly helpful, I think, to have an ombuds person to, to kind, of, um, kind of break it down for you and, and work with the servicer to get the answers you need. We've also um, you know, used the information that we get from our, our complaints to, to identify emerging issues related to student loans and servicing. We um, you know, have used the information in the complaints to create outreach such as um, the PSLF, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness, as was mentioned earlier. Um, you know, based in part on consumer complaints about the difficulties tied to determining whether you um, are on track for forgiveness and why you've been denied, um, we join forces with MoneyWiser to educate borrowers about PSLF and how to ensure they are on track for loan forgiveness. Um, so it, it is really important that we hear from the consumers in order for us to do our job to better protect um, borrowers and to help advise um, decision makers and policy makers as to you know how to correct um, flaws um, that have developed in the system um, you know to uh, with servicers so important to get those complaints to us and I'll pass it back to Martha to discuss a little bit more about the process for submitting complaints in Colorado yeah, while, while we have such a good crew of participants on this webinar, I can't um, pass up the opportunity to put in a plug for um, if you or someone that you know is experiencing a problem with their student loan um, and their student loan servicer, uh, it's, it's easy to file a complaint with us and, and we'd love to hear about it. Um, the easiest way to do it is to go to coag.gov slash student loans. You can find our student loan complaint forms there as well as some of the education materials that, Ed, uh, that Libby referenced. We have education materials about public service loan forgiveness, as well as some of the scams that we do get complaints against a lot that A.D. Weiser was referencing about, um, you know, folks who might try to take advantage of people who are trying to navigate the repayment process. So um, again, that's coag.gov slash student loans. So Seth, um, we'd love to ask you some questions if that, if that works for you. Sure. Sounds great. Um, so, you know, we're, as we said, our office is really looking for emerging trends and, and we want to be um, tracking as best we can what's going on with borrowers on the ground. So what are you all seeing in terms of emerging threats, both at the national level and at the state level? Sure. So I also want to put in a, a quick plug for uh, your guys' office and the ombudsman. Um, before I uh, uh, jump into the question. Um, so um, there are a lot of people in the state of Colorado who've worked incredibly hard to set this up. Um, the Attorney General himself, um, the Majority Leader, AARP, New Era, uh, AF, uh, American Federation of Teachers, and I could go on and on and on. And they did so because they knew how important it was. Um, and as Martha was saying, I could say firsthand um, the number of people I talked to who are somewhat skittish about filing a complaint, weren't sure if they should, what, weren't really sure of the value. Um, and I could say it has tremendous value. Um, all of the work that I've been able to accomplish at the Bureau, the hundreds of millions of dollars that we were able to get back, um, 
And I'm sure for you guys, the millions and millions of dollars you guys have gotten back for people ripped off by for-profit schools, um, by shady private student loans, are all driven because borrowers stepped up and filed a complaint about themselves. Because what we know is, as Martha was saying, if something is happening to you, most likely it is happening to other people. And this market is so big and the companies are so huge, potentially happening to thousands or tens of thousands of people. So you should listen to all of these guys uh, on this webinar. And if you uh, are having problems with your student loan to file a complaint because you're really lucky um, that not only you have this office, but you have such amazing people in all of, in all of these roles. So uh, back to the question. So emerging threats. Um, so I think one of the things, and I think uh, the Attorney General mentioned this, um, that we are really concerned about is the extent to which um, we've seen how COVID has really driven um, what we think are really emerging risks in this space. So um, some of these are companies parading around as financial innovation, um, but are actually quite concerning in terms of their outputs for borrowers. So we see kind of special private student lenders, um, income share agreements, who are all trying to really capitalize on the COVID crisis and borrowers being worried about uh, retraining or getting a new job or getting a different job, kind of pop up onto the scene um, and talk about how they are going to solve the student debt crisis or they are this very unique consumer focused mission. And too often the promises aren't really backed up by reality. And I think um, one of the underlying messages always um, is um, we have seen time and time again how people entering the student loan space often uh, purport to be so with uh, grandiose visions of being pro-consumer or helping borrowers or being the solution to what ails you. Um, but unfortunately, it's incumbent, I think it's really wise for people to kind of take a deep breath um, and you know, look under the hood. I think you know you guys, for example, right in the College America have uh, tons of examples of schools touting future astronomical wage growth and job placement rates. Um, and you know, you guys are amazing for actually holding companies to accountable for actually, you know, uh, holding them to their deceptive ads. So I think the concern on the emerging risks piece is how um, like the current economic crisis, I think, creates an opportunity for all of these, these kind of newfangled players to, to act. Thank you, Seth. And, and given that, you know, the, these emerging sort of scams that are on the horizon or that have already arrived, um, you know, what should consumers be looking out for right now? I know that there's some student debt relief scams, but, but what, in addition to those, or maybe we can speak a little bit about those, what should consumers be looking for? Sure. Well, so that's a great question. Um, and I think the number one piece of advice is um, you should never pay anyone to help you try to um, get into a benefit plan or help you with your student loans. Unfortunately, what we've seen is a lot of companies have really replicated the worst practices of the mortgage crisis and the mortgage markets where, you know, not too long ago, we were inundated with foreclosure rescue scams where um, people were desperate to save their homes and would pay maybe thousands and thousands of dollars to people who are essentially just stealing the money. Unfortunately, what we've seen now is those practices have just been replicated in the student loan space. Um, and you can understand the, the frustration. The Attorney General mentioned the astronomical rates of um, people getting denied public service loan forgiveness program. There's comparable stats for borrowers struggling to get into income driven repayment plans, uh, teachers struggling to get into their benefits. So people are really hurting and the companies that should be helping them are kind of failing. And so what is really filled in these gaps are just outright scammers, people who are either stealing your money or ultimately um, uh, charging you a ton of money for something that should just be free. So I think the first piece of advice is um, be wary of what you're seeing on Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat. Um, we did a lot of work um, at the CFPB trying to get these companies to be much more accountable 
for the ads or the pages on their websites because quite often um, they are riddled with bad information and lead generators um, for pretty um, predatory companies. So just be careful about uh, social media. Don't pay uh, anyone for help to get enrolled into public service loan forgiveness or a TEACH grant or um, income driven repayment plans. Um, and if you run across these companies, do reach out to the attorney general's office. Um, we've seen um, state AGs bring dozens and dozens and dozens of cases against companies like these. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it's kind of too late and they've already kind of packed up and, and left town. But we have seen e examples of people get relief and their money back. But I think this is one where a little bit of education um, actually goes a long way towards people avoiding kind of giving away the last dollar they have in their, in their bank account. Seth, if I could just jump in yeah. on that point. Um, all of you on this call with us, you are advocates, champions, and ambassadors. This education effort, people not knowing what they don't know is a big challenge. Your ability to let people know about resources that our office is here, um, we appreciate that. We really got to leverage that spirit here in Colorado that we're all in this together and looking out for each other. So Seth, you mentioned that the um, the payment pause, at least for those federally held um, student loans who were eligible for the payment pause, is coming to an end at the end of the year. Um, what should borrowers be thinking about as their student loan situation changes dramatically um, from having no payments due for, for this, this period to, to having the, the light switch back on or the faucet reopened, whichever metaphor you want to use? <laughs> Yeah, so there's obviously a lot of things to be worried about right now. Um, and I don't mean to add another one to everyone's plate, but I think the situation in the student loan market is really quite concerning. Um, so as Martha mentioned, um, for tens of millions of borrowers, at least, at least what we know now is their payments can turn back on on January 1st. Um, you know, I think there's still hope that you might see either more congressional action or more administrative action. Um, but I think we all kind of know the state of DC and Congress now, that is certainly not something to take to the bank. So there is a real chance for tens of millions of Americans, um, they see their student, they're gonna see their student loan bill turn back on, um, whether they realize it or not. Um, and I think um, there's a couple of things that we've been trying to advise people is um, if you're really concerned about your student loan, um, and you're kind of, with all of this uncertainty, you know that they, uh, uh, if the student loan bill gets turned back on, it will be a significant hit, is make sure you at least turn off your auto pay. Um, we've seen people like really struggle um, when they have uh, a payment taken out, what that means in, you know, for paying a rent bill or a car payment until they can get the money back. Um, but also, no, it's hard to advise because there might be a very long payment pause again, depending on the election, right? But borrowers should be aware of income-driven repayment plans, where if you lost your job or you have a significant um, uh, cut in pay, um, you could uh, be enrolled in an income-driven repayment plan and pay zero dollars on your loans and be in good standing. So that is a really good option for federally student loan borrowers who have taken a hit. Uh, and again, I would be ready and talking to your servicer now uh, if you fall into that bucket, unfortunately. But I think the final piece is just, um, I think just kind of be ready and be aware because um, the student loan industry was quite broken before any of this happened. And, um, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of reasons why none of us sleep these days, but I think the idea that the Department of Education and the current student loan companies are going to overnight turn on 30 million accounts um, and they're not going to be significant and huge problems, I think is, at least for me, because what I do is I'm pretty, pretty high on the top of the list. Um, so I think people should just be ready, start reaching out to their student loan company now about what options they have uh, about how to be prepared for this, this pretty important moment in time. And Seth, can I just add to that question? We get a lot of people who are um, seeking public service loan forgiveness. Um, and I would just 
if you could just speak a little bit to the payment pause and um, its effect on public service loan forgiveness. I know that that's, that's a topic that a lot of um, folks have come to us about. Sure. So it's a great question. So the payment pause it was supposed to be designed so that borrowers pursuing public service loan forgiveness aren't left worse off. Um, where borrowers, um, even if they took advantage of the payment pause, even if they didn't proactively make payments, um, if they were still employed in a public uh, service job, um, eligible public service job, would uh, have those months count as qualifying payments. So the first thing that you should know is, as the law is structured, you shouldn't have to like voluntarily go out and make payments when you shouldn't have to. Um, but what we've been advising everyone is to make sure that these are actually being tracked appropriately, right? To make sure um, that either currently or when the payment pause ends, um, that you are actually given the credit for the months like Congress designed this program to be and through the executive action. And I think unfortunately what we've seen in PSLF is, you know, just be exceedingly diligent about having all of your paperwork um, is to ensure you get your ECFs um, repeatedly so you have some tracking of your student loans. I think more of a policy thing that I'm really worried about is I'm sure everyone has seen the estimates of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of um, educator jobs, of local government jobs. Um, and for a lot of those borrowers, um, those people, I think they were you know, near PSLF or working towards PSLF. Um, and I'm just really worried about what their impact's gonna be on their ability to get loan forgiveness if we see these like tremendous uh, potential unemployment in the public sector. So that's kind of more of a policy issue, but something that is like a really concern to us is the, the kind of jobs fallout of the coronavirus being this real impediment to public service workers and you know, the downstream ramifications on the PSLF program. And Seth, um, what, what happens um, when loans are transferred? And do you, and I know um, there's a big contracting um, issue um, coming through for the, that, uh, for the major student loan servicers. How should borrowers prepare if they think their loan is being transferred and what you know, issues come up for borrowers when their loans are being transferred? Yeah, so it's a great question. So, um, so one of the things we always talk about is how student loan, student loan borrowers and, and student loans are just treated worse, <laughs> there's no other word, worse than nearly any other forms of credit, right? So if you have a mortgage and your loan gets transferred between um, mortgage companies, you have kind of all of these baked in protections. Um, at the federal level, none of those really exist for student loan borrowers. Um, uh, you know, Colorado helped in this when they passed their borrower bill of rights to actually build in some state level protections about what happens if your loans get transferred. Um, but we just know that this is a moment where paperwork gets lost, you're enrolled in one plan and they, they drop you. So um, what we always advise of people is to, um, you know, a lot of times borrowers like don't even know this is going to happen. Um, if you have a mortgage, you have like much better disclosures and people tell you uh, about uh, this is incoming and, and who to expect. That isn't always the case in the student loan market. So uh, as Martha was referencing, the federal government is going through this whole big crazy recontracting um, uh, process, which will hopefully make the situation worse. But it could definitely mean over the course of the next couple of years uh, that you see a, stu a different student loan company, or even if you don't know it, a different student loan company will be in charge of your loan. So I think it's a really good point um, is uh, now is the time to try to figure out if you could get your house in order. You know, I think now is the time to figure out if you are planning to get public service loan forgiveness, um, to get a pretty full accounting of all of your payments when they were made, um, making sure you're up to date. Um, I think checking in with your student loan company to make sure they have your accurate information, um, making sure they even know how to contact you and they're not sending your information to a random email address or a random uh, actual physical address from where you left college or something. So um, one of the, uh, it's a really good piece of advice and question, which is um, it's always good, I think, to 
uh, make sure with your student loan company, your information is up to date um, and making sure that if there are seminal documents you need um, that you, uh, the company made representations to you or you're relying on for PSLF or teacher forgiveness program or total and permanent disability, um, that you actually have a copy of those either in your inbox or a physical copy somewhere uh, as well. Thank you, Seth. And one, one last question. I, um, obviously, borrowers can file complaints with, with our office and seek help from us, but, but where, can it, where can borrowers go to get individual help with, with some of the issues um, that they're facing right now? Sure. So, um, so I think we talked about them a lot today. Um, and, you know, um, if you feel as if you've gotten bad information or you're getting the runaround or, you know, in the public service loan forgiveness context, if the person up the uh, office from you is getting uh, invocations that they are eligible and you're not, or, you know, whatever other crazy stuff we've seen in the student loan context, um, know that there are people out there to help. And I think you can file a complaint with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I know we've talked about it a lot today, but we can't say enough about filing a complaint with the state ombudsman office. Um, um, because uh, we, uh, we worked with this law professor who found out that um, they tracked all of these borrowers that were struggling. Um, and they interviewed like 65 different borrowers um, and only four actually reached out to get help from a lawyer or the government, um, despite looking at kind of the full range and realizing that a whole lot of them actually could have been getting help from someone else. Um, so I said it before, I kind of jumped the gun, I should have saved it for this, is a lot of people worked really, really hard over some of the most powerful special interests in the student loan context um, to pass the Colorado Borrower Bill of Rights and create some really special things at the state. Um, but it's only as good as the people, uh, the information that the people you all um, uh, get from borrowers in terms of their complaints, in terms of their stories. Um, so um, Martha will probably say the email address again, but the first place that I would go um, is actually to file a complaint. Even if you, you know, aren't sure, um, it's still always helpful to, to learn more. Um, and the people who read those can best understand um, is there a potential violation? Did the company do something wrong? Are there avenues to, to help? So um, I would, you know, the first place I would go is to uh, your guys' office. And Seth, we actually, we got a question, um, or I got a question through, through our, um, through our uh, attorney general chat, which is um, sort of piggybacking off of that, you know, how does someone know if they're having a problem with their student loan? And um, you know, I'll add, add my commentary and then I would love to hear your thoughts on it, which is to say that, you know, I worked at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau with you. I now work at an attorney general's office. I can't tell you the number of people who work in those organizations who come to me with questions about student loans. This is something that people who are sophisticated, who think about consumer protection issues all the time, still just encounter roadblocks. And it may be that it's simple to, to plow through that roadblock, or maybe that there's a real underlying problem, um, but we, we can help navigate that process for you. And um, Seth, I don't know if you have further thoughts on that yeah. as well. Yeah, I, you know, I've never met someone who's worked in government and like law enforcement or a regulator who gets mad at someone who files a complaint, right? I think we just get upset when people who have been ripped off don't realize that we're there to, to help, right? And I think, part of what this amazing woman who works for me always says is it's not your job to figure out if the company did something wrong that's that's all of our jobs right if you just feel like something didn't seem right or there's a charge on your student loan bill or you can't seem to get enrolled in help or you get a different call rep each time getting different answers that's the type of stuff that i know you all want to hear we loved hearing about because we didn't love hearing about it, right? But that's what we wanted to know because it helped us do our job better. So, you know, she said it better than I did, which is, you know, for those people who are just aren't sure, um, it's not your job to figure out if your student loan company made a mistake. I think there's a lot of people um, who wake up every day trying to understand the nuts and bolts of the system. And the best thing you could do is to share your story with them so they could try to get to, um, get to the bottom of it.
So I think we've gone through our questions. Uh, the opportunity for everyone here is please be a champion, support others. There's a huge lack of awareness. I think Martha said it really well. Having Libby as an ombudsperson is part of our solution, but we need to make this a team sport. And please do what you can to spread the word, share resources, and when people are stumbling, hitting roadblocks, we wanna hear about it. Um, Seth, thanks for joining us. Martha and Libby, thanks for all you're doing to support consumers and student borrowers here in Colorado. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care Thank now. Thank you. Bye-bye.